Thank you, Rachel, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you. Uh, it was rainy and soggy in Columbus, Ohio when I left, so I came to a nice surprise here in, in Wichita. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, language and Latino health, and I'm going to start with a story. My name is Mari Carmen Gonzalez. I have three children, one boy and two girls. My youngest daughter is Michelle. She's 12 years old, and this is our story. Michelle has always been a darling young person. As a baby, her beaming brown eyes and her crooked smile would light up any room. I would dress her up in cute dresses and put matching bows in her hair to complement her natural disposition. Every time I walked down the street or entered a store, people would stop me and ask to give the child un cariñito. While Michelle was always outwardly pleasant, she was a bit introverted, I would admit. I'll never forget Michelle's seventh birthday. It was that day that my life changed forever. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard a howling screech coming from the girls' room. I jumped out of bed, petrified, and ran as fast as I could to their room. Michelle was standing on her bed, crying hysterically. Quítamelos, quítamelos, take them off me, get them off me. Michelle's sister and I ran up to her and grabbed hold of her stiff arms. Quítamelos, quítamelos, los bichos, the insects, quítamelos, take them off. Seeing nothing on her arms, I immediately ripped the sheets off the bed and found nothing. Quítamelos, quítamelos, Michelle continued to cry. I remember picking her up and bringing her with me to my room. Sitting in bed, I rocked her, sung her a lullaby, and prayed that God would give her peace. I was terrified. The next day, I took Michelle to the doctor. After a battery of tests and three appointments later, I was told that Michelle had schizophrenia, severe autism, epilepsy, and developmental delay. It was a life-shattering experience. I never imagined myself on such a steep uphill climb. I'm a single mom, and it's so hard for me to keep a job provide, and provide for all the medical needs of my daughter. I enrolled in night classes at cosmetology school and put a small beauty salon in my house. I don't make a lot of money, but at least I can be home with Michelle. Michelle's on medications for the hallucinations and spends most of her time at home, in her room, wandering the halls and talking to herself. It's just hard. It's hard to talk to her. I wish I could do more for her. It's just hard. It's hard to deal with this system in the US. I don't speak English very well. I have trouble talking to my daughter's teachers. We have meetings to discuss Michelle's academic needs. They tell me they're going to do everything in their power to help her, but they never keep their promises. I feel ignored most of the time. School is really just a daycare. My daughter is 12 years old and can't read. She doesn't know how to add or subtract. She rarely speaks in complete sentences. It's frustrating. I feel like I don't have a voice, like I'm almost invisible. And school is just the beginning. I feel just as helpless with the doctors. The nurses and receptionists are just plain rude. I feel as if they're mad at me because I don't speak English. And they scold me for arriving late to my appointments. Oftentimes, I have appointments with several doctors on the same day. If one doctor is late, I'll be late to all my other appointments. It's also hard for me to follow all the doctor's instructions. My daughter's neurologist, for example, ordered one-on-one -on -one help for Michelle at school. I had to fight the school to get it, and to this day, it hasn't happened. The people at the pharmacy are very helpful. Michelle takes six different medications every day. The pharmacists give me medicine bottles with different colored lids to help me keep everything straight. Every day is a battle, a struggle to help my child. I think if I spoke English, the doctors, nurses, receptionists, and teachers would take me more seriously. I'm taking English classes to learn English. One day, I will be able to help my child born. One day, when I know English. I begin with this story because it's illustrative of the multiple and intersectional impacts of language on the health and well-being 
of Latino populations in the United States. Mari Carmen's struggles with language are far-reaching and diverse. They affect her ability to negotiate optimal outcomes with her child's teachers, and they impact her interactions in healthcare settings. When looking at Mari Carmen's struggles, we might be tempted to focus on the adverse outcomes that the language barrier is producing in her child. Michelle cannot read. Michelle cannot add and subtract. Michelle's medical condition is not improving, but deteriorating. Following doctor's recommendations is a challenge, and keeping up with the hectic pace of multiple treatment proves to be difficult. Yet the impact of Mari Carmen's struggles far surpass the poor outcomes of her child's care and also seem to take a toll on Mari Carmen herself. She feels invisible, unheard. She's frustrated by the neglect of officials entrusted as partners in her child's welfare, teachers, school administrators, doctors, nurses. She's caught in the cross currents of multi-morbid chronic care treatment and the wider economic demands and social expectations imposed upon her. She feels guilty because her ability to arrive at appointments on time and to follow doctor's, doctor's orders are oftentimes beyond her reach. Added to the poor outcomes of her child's care are these more self-debilitating outcomes in Mari Carmen herself. Mari Carmen's feelings of guilt and impotence, moreover, cannot be bracketed off from the overarching experience and burden of illness. Each instance of microaggression experienced in the doctor's office, each promise made and broken by school officials, feeds right back in to the overwhelming burden she deals with day in and day out, and adds to the frustration of seeing little progress in her daughter's treatment. In spite of it all, however, Mari Carmen is resilient. Mari Carmen looks out on the horizon and sees just beyond it to that one day, that one day when she'll be able to help her child more, that one day when she knows English. Mari Carmen's resilience, her faith in that one day, is really the impetus of this talk. Perhaps she is overly optimistic about the influence of knowing English. Perhaps simply knowing English would not fundamentally change her plight. But this talk looks beyond her faith in English to her deep-seated desire to improve the health outcomes and the well-being of her child. The foundation of Mari Carmen's resilience is found at its core in this overriding desire, in her desire that one day she will be able to help her child more. And it's this desire that leads me to ask, what role do language professionals, Spanish teachers, English teachers, interpreter trainers, language researchers, what role do we play in getting to that one day that drives Mari Carmen's resilience? What perspectives do we bring to the broader discussions about Latino health and well-being and the elimination of health disparities in Latino populations? Language and the literacies that it generates and sustains have long been recognized as critical factors in addressing health disparities in Latino populations in the United States. So in this talk, I'm gonna consider the role of language in Latino health. So how does language affect health? To speak of the relationship between language and health is to cover an enormous conceptual stretch. A novice might approach the topic wondering how the specific set of lexical items and grammatical rules a person uses to communicate impinges on the presence of disease states in that individual. However, such an approach would miss much of the larger conceptualization both of language and of health. The World Health Organization, as you know, as early as 1946, adopted a view of health that eschewed the notion that health is simply the absence of disease. According to the WHO, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. By this definition, the question of the relationship of language and health requires attention 
not only to disease states, but also to the myriad factors affecting complete physical, mental, and social well-being. In the same vein, a view of language as a specific set of lexical items and grammatical rules used to communicate misses the mark of our current conceptualization of language. While Ferdinand de Saussure defined language as a social property of the faculty of speech and a collection of necessary conventions that have been adopted by a social body to permit individuals to exercise that faculty, he was quick to distinguish this abstracted notion of language from what he called speech or parole, which he characterized as many-sided and heterogeneous and as belonging both to the individual and society. So Sewer bracketed off speech from his consideration because he found that in speech there was no unity to be discovered. And this same division was held well into the 20th century and became in fact a foundational tenet of at least one variety of linguistic science. Under this conceptualization, it might be plausible to understand the relationship between language and health as something entirely different from the relationship between health and speech, effectively extirpating the whole question of language use or speech in healthcare contexts from the purview of linguistics. Yet linguistics has not shied away from the consideration of language use. In fact, a whole field of linguistics, namely sociolinguistics, has emerged that is dedicated principally to understanding how language is used in social contexts and for social purposes. Del Himes referred to this approach as a socially constituted linguistics in which all questions about language are to some extent embedded in social analysis. This pioneering, these pioneering ideas in conjunction with those proposed by a long line of other scholars have considerably expanded our notion of what language is and what it means to study it. From the tradition of sociolinguistic scholarship, myriad perspectives on language have emerged, including the study of language variation, language stylization, language attitudes and ideologies, language maintenance and shift, and the list goes on and on. But what's clear from the legacy of sociolinguistics is that the relationship between language and health, both of them broadly conceived, is a rich, complex, and multifaceted area of linguistic inquiry. The relationship between language and health can be viewed from at least two distinct standpoints. First, we can think of language as a determinant of access to care. Language is the vehicle through which patients and providers give and receive information. In the absence of a shared communicative system, access to care will be limited. Limited access prevents patients from expressing symptoms, side effects, and other essential information for providers to deliver treatment. At the same time, limited access curtails the patient's ability to obtain that information that's critical for understanding their condition its symptoms, its treatments, and the risk factors that can aggravate it. Limited access to information is perhaps the most obvious adverse effect of language barriers, and it's a significant factor in the relationship between language and health. In Latino populations, the negative impacts of limited access to information have led to tragic events. The story of Griselda Zamora is one such tragedy. Griselda was a 13-year-old from Yuma, Arizona, who, like many children whose parents speak limited English, served as her family's interpreter. When Griselda developed severe abdominal pain, her parents rushed her to the hospital. Unfortunately, Griselda was too sick to interpret for herself, and the hospital didn't provide an interpreter. A night of observation passed. Without the aid of, of an interpreter, her Spanish-speaking parents were told to bring her back immediately if her symptoms worsened or otherwise to follow up with her doctor in three days. The parents, however, understood from the conversation that they should wait three days to see the doctor. After two days, with Griselda's condition deteriorating, they felt they could no longer wait and rushed her back to the emergency room. Doctors there discovered that she had a ruptured appendix. She was airlifted to a nearby medical center in Phoenix, 
and died a few hours later. Stories such as this one have led policymakers to understand the need to eliminate language barriers in healthcare. The obvious solution in cases such as these is the use of trained professional interpreter staff members to bridge the information gap between patients and providers. The field of medical interpreting has grown substantially since the 1990s and today constitutes a vital service for Spanish-speaking patients in the U.S. health delivery system. The medical interpreting profession has developed standards of practice and ethical guidelines to ensure the quality of interpreted medical encounters. The provision of professional interpretation services in the care of non-English speaking patients has rapidly become the standard of care enshrined in the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services, the accreditation standards for effective communication of the Joint Commission, and other examples. Notwithstanding the advances realized in the closing of the gap between English-speaking providers and their Spanish-speaking patients, there are other ways in which language intervenes in health and healthcare. While language obviously serves a communicative function that is essential in healthcare encounters, it also serves other functions which sociolinguistic, sociolinguists have strived to enumerate. Language serves as a bond between its speakers, endearing them to each other. And it also serves as a form of symbolic capital, establishing and perpetuating social hierarchies. Similarly, through language, people fashion their identity, stylizing themselves and sometimes crossing, that is, using the language variety that belongs to another group. These insights into the identity function of language suggest that language differences are never neutral, but rather always charged with deep-seated and heartfelt meaning. Language is deeply personal. In her poem, You Know How to Say Arroz Con Pollo, But Not What You Are, poet Melissa Lozado Oliva explores what it means to claim Spanish as her own. And this is what she says. If you ask me if I'm fluent in Spanish, I will tell you, my Spanish is understanding that there are stories that will always be out of my reach. My Spanish is understanding that there are people who will never fit together the way I want them to. My Spanish is understanding that there are some letters that will always stay silent. My Spanish is understanding that there are some words that will always escape me. For Losada Oliva, language is fundamental not only to, our identity, to her identity, but also to her personhood. Her Spanish is who she is. The identity function of language, embedded as it is in a whole array of social hierarchies, racial and ethnic prejudices, and social expectations, also impinges on the relationship of language and health. If the communicative function of language limits access to health care, the identity function of language limits and strains acceptance in health care. It's not enough to just have access to information. There's also a need to feel accepted and welcomed in the health care encounter. Lack of acceptance leads to mistrust between patients and providers and has the potential to override any gains realized through access. Lack of acceptance, moreover, shapes dispositions on both the provider and the patient's side. Perhaps a patient's lack of compliance, perhaps a patient's leaving the hospital against medical advice are nothing more than a symptom of lack of trust. Perhaps a doctor's overutilization of costly tests and increased worries about medical malpractice lawsuits when treating limited English proficient patients stems from a lack of acceptance. The use of interpreters does little to mitigate the barriers of acceptance occasioned by language barriers. Telephonic interpreter Natalie Kelly, for example, describes how her mediation skills, her interpreting skills, even while effective in closing the access gap, were useless in bridging the gap of acceptance. She writes, on the flip side, I've witnessed by phone some behavior by providers that's offensive or rude. I've interpreted for patients who ask, why is the doctor speaking so slowly to me? Does he think I'm stupid? 
I've also interpreted the words, please tell the nurse not to yell at me. I don't have a hearing problem, I just don't speak English. Recently, I heard a physician say, in all seriousness, next time you come, you speak English, understand? As if mastery of a new language would magically occur by the follow-up appointment. Kelly's observation suggests that something more than interpreters is needed to address this dimension of the language barrier. Some have argued that training healthcare providers on how to work with interpreters is needed. Others have contended that successfully confronting these issues requires training and cultural competence. While both may be partially on point, it's important to realize that language acceptance is part of a much larger habitus in which healthcare is couched. Seth Holmes, in his ethnography of Oaxacan migrant farm workers, argues that cultural competency training models often fail to adequately frame the problem of this larger habitus. He contends that most cultural competency training programs focus on lists of stereotypical cultural traits and thus implicitly present culture as the problem. Instead, he argues, following Jonathan Metzl, that medical educators should focus on the social analysis and structural competency rather than on cultural competency. Tervalon and Murray Garcia, on the other hand, propose the notion of cultural humility as an alternative to cultural competency that would address the larger habitus of healthcare. Cultural humility proves to be a powerful, a more powerful concept than cultural competence in as much as it attempts to reframe competence in terms of dispositions rather than knowledge or skills. Cultural humility is approaching other cultures with a pervasive desire to learn. It's listening attentively. It's not assuming a shared perspective. Cultural competence is something you achieve once and for all after a training session. But cultural humility is something you do over and over again. Tervalon and Murray Garcia provide an example of the differences between cultural competence and cultural humility. They recall a Latina female speaking patient who's complaining of excruciating pain after a surgical procedure. The patient is seen by an English speaking doctor in the presence of a Latina nurse. The doctor is concerned about the patient's pain. The nurse, however, replies that Latinas generally exaggerate their pain and that she's probably fine with the current level of pain medication. In this case, the nurse is presenting herself as culturally competent, but not as culturally humble. She's not disposed to learn from the patient, but rather assumes that her complaining is an exaggeration. She's oblivious to the power imbalances that are present in the situation and fails to recognize that her representation of herself as a cultural expert undermined the patient's legitimate request for additional pain medication. The uptake of these ideas and approaches, however, pale in comparison to the progress that has been achieved in the implementation of interpretive services. For the time being, it, appear, it appears that solutions to the language acceptance dimension of language barriers will continue to lag behind progress on the language access dimension. I'm hopeful that efforts to cultivate a pipeline of bilingual health professionals will have the potential of yielding greater progress on this front. So moving on from the relationship between language and health to language as a social determinant and language as a, system, as a syndemic. The empirical study of the impact of Spanish language preference and use in Latino populations has evolved considerably over the past two decades. In this section, I want to consider the major thrust and evolution of, the, of this empirical research, identify gaps, and propose alternative theoretical insights that may provide new understandings of the place of Spanish and Latino health. Early studies have focused on Spanish language preference as a stable dichotomous Spanish versus English, or perhaps trichotomous Spanish versus bilingual versus English, variable that sheds light on patterns of disease distribution or access to care. 
Rooted in social epidemiology, a subfield of epidemiology that seeks to uncover the influence of social circumstances on health, these studies viewed Spanish language preference use and or proficiency as a social determinant of health. Social determinants of health can be viewed as causes of causes of illness or wellness. For example, we understand that a diet high in saturated fat and salt can lead to greater likelihood of a heart attack. We've typically understood such a, uh, causes such as diets high in saturated fat and salt as risk factors of the ultimate outcome. Social determinants take a step back and consider the reason why some people are more likely than others to consume this type of high-risk diet. Michael Marmot has noted, it's not an accident that people consume diets high in saturated fat and salt. It represents the nature of the food supply, culture, affordability, and availability, among other influences. These more distal influences, then, are viewed as social determinants of health. This figure visually represents the concept of social determinants of health. The visual representation highlights a unidirectional influence wherein social structure, up on the left-hand corner, impacts well-being and morbidity and mortality in the lower right-hand corner. The pathways of influence can either be material, as seen in that direct line, or they can be mediating influences in the form of early life experiences, genetic disposition, or cultural factors, which you see in those arrows pointing upward. In the center of the diagram, we see a complex chain of causation that takes us from social structure through either work experience or the social environment. These two factors, in turn, may influence both health behaviors and psychological factors. Psychological factors have a direct impact on the brain, and both the brain and psychological factors may influence health behaviors, as noted in the dual-headed arrows. Finally, the factors in the brain and in health behaviors influence pathological changes, which then ultimately lead to well-being, morbidity, and mortality. Studies of Latino health that consider language as a social determinant of health can be sorted into those that look at language preference, use, or proficiency of the patient as a factor influencing health outcomes, and those that look at the impact of language concordance between provider and patient. Studies focusing on language preference, use, or proficiency have identified outcome factors related to both access to care and specific health outcomes. These studies provide conclusive evidence that Spanish language preference, use, and proficiency are associated with limited access to, to health service and with less than optimal health outcomes. Access-oriented studies have focused on cancer screening and on receipt of recommended care, among many other factors. Jacobs, in a 2005 article, for example, found that women who only spoke a Spanish, who only spoke a language other than English, had a lower likelihood of cancer screening than women who spoke English. Cheng, in a 2007 study, focused on patient receipt of eligible healthcare services by Latino and white patients using data from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey of, 20, of 2003. He compared white patients with Latino patients who spoke English at home, Latino patients who did not speak English at home, but were comfortable speaking English, and Latino patients who did not speak English at home and were, comfortable, were not comfortable speaking English. 53.6% of Latinos who spoke English at home received all eligible healthcare services, but only 35% of Latinos who did not speak English at home and were not comfortable speaking English received these same services. Outcome-oriented studies point to disparities in the results of care and have focused on vaccination, length of hospital stays, and informed consent. A study of influenza vaccination among Latino seniors in the southeast of the US, for example, found that Spanish-preferring and linguistically isolated seniors were far more likely to have lower rates of vaccination than non-Hispanic whites. 
A study of length of, stay, length of hospital stays compared limited English proficient patients with English proficient patients and found that LEP or limited English proficient patients stay in the hospital 6% longer than English proficient patients. Another hospital-based study examined the documentation of informed consent for, in com for common invasive procedures among LEP and English proficient patients. This study found that English proficient patients were three times more likely than limited English proficient patients to have full informed consent documentation in the medical record. Studies of language concordance seek to elucidate the effects of receiving care from a Spanish-speaking provider. Language concordant care occurs when Spanish-speaking patients are seen by a provider who also speaks Spanish. Language discordant care occurs when a Spanish-speaking patient is seen by a provider who does not speak Spanish. Language concordant studies with Latino populations have focused on specific health outcomes, on quality of care, and on intersubjective processes in the healthcare encounter. Outcome studies, for instance, have looked at issues like glycemic control among Spanish-speaking patients with diabetes. A study in 2010 looked at the relative glycemic control between a group of uh, patients who were English-speaking and a group of Spanish-speaking patients with language concordant providers. And what they found was that patients with language concordant providers were more likely to have good uh, glucose control, right? good glycemic control, and better management of their diabetes. A follow-up study was conducted to confirm these findings, uh, this in 2017. And the study set out to determine the impact on glycemic control and cholesterol control when a Spanish-speaking patient with diabetes switched from a language discordant physician, that is one who didn't speak Spanish, to a language concordant physician, one who did speak Spanish. Among patients who switched physicians, there was a 10% increase in glycemic control and a 15% in increase in LDL cholesterol control. Language concordance studies have also focused on quality of health care, investigating measures such as patient satisfaction, timeliness of care, and hospital discharge processes. A study of foreign-born limited English proficient Latino patients drawn from the Latino Health Survey indicated that these patients were more likely to self-report clinical experiences as confusing, frustrating, and of poor quality. The study set out to determine if patients receiving language concordant care were more or less likely to report these, self-report these experiences. The findings revealed that patients with language concordant physicians were less likely to report confusion, frustration, or poor quality in comparison to patients with language discordant physicians. The authors conclude that while, the, while the English language proficiency is important in receiving quality care, the fact that the patient and the doctor speak the same language seems to be more important. Finally, language concordant studies have measured intersubjective processes, such as agreement with physician recommendations, number of questions asked of uh, patients to their, to their providers, and perceptions of discrimination. These intersubjective oriented studies also point to the advantages of language concordant care. A study that examined physician patient agreement about physician recommendations for health behaviors found that patients with language concordant physicians were more likely to agree with their physician's recommendations about exercise than those with language discordant physicians. Another study examined the influence of language concordance uh, on interpersonal care as a function of communication, decision making, and interpersonal style. Patients with language concordant physicians in comparison to patients with language discordant physicians were less likely to perceive lack of clarity in physician communication and more likely to indicate that the doctor elicited concerns and explained results. Patients' improved perceptions of interpersonal care with language concordant physicians has also shown, been shown to impact the number of questions that patients tend to ask. Language concordant care increases the number of patient, of patient asked questions uh, during a visit, one study found. Together, these studies 
established language as a social determinant of health. They show that language preference, use, and proficiency have a measurable impact on access to services and on, and on health outcomes. Further, they suggest that when language concordant providers are present, there's improvement in health outcomes, quality of care, and intersubjective processes. Recent research, however, has begun to push the boundaries of these associations. For example, researchers are beginning to question how Spanish language preference, use, and proficiency interact with other well-known social determinants of health. They're also questioning whether the influence of intersubjective processes, uh, what the influence of intersubjective processes is beyond the language concordant healthcare encounter. Studies that seek to shed light on the interaction between language and other social determinants are beginning to uncover heretofore unnoticed connections. For example, researchers are beginning to look at mediating factors that might affect the relationship between language and health, including racial identification and place of origin. As Abraido Lanza points out, Latino groups differ in social political histories and reasons for migrating to the United States. Moreover, the context of reception in the United States differs for the various groups and at different points as a result of economic conditions, labor shortages, and the political climate. These differential concepts can shape the ways that language interacts with health. Economic conditions, labor shortages, and the political climate can significantly reduce the frequency of contact between Spanish speakers and health and social service agencies. Other studies are zeroing in on post-migration perceived social mobility as a factor that interacts with language. These studies focus on the perception of upward or downward mobility as a function of migration. An examination of data drawn from the National Latino and Asian American study found that major depressive events were positively correlated with perceptions of post-migration and downward mobility. Together, these studies appear to suggest that social determinants, including language, may be relative to the context in which they emerge and may be dependent upon previous experiences. Shia 2017 pointed out that language discordance is situated in the complex tension of political power and linguistic legitimacy, an under-theorized and under-synthesized area of research on LEP patients is the various factors that may serve as mediating and moderating factors for language discordant patients' experiences in healthcare. In addition to questions about the interactions and situatedness of language and other social determinants, researchers are also beginning to focus on issues of intersubjectivity beyond the clinical encounter. How do intersubjective processes influence health outcomes and healthcare access? A study of health beliefs, health promotion practices, past healthcare experiences, and transition to a new society and healthcare system among 20 Latina women in Utah found that women expressed feelings of aloneness in seeking healthcare. The women in this study recalled that in their home countries, illness was handled in a more social way. One of the women uh, of the, in the study confided, I felt that I could not defend myself in this country. A study of language barriers among Latina mothers in Detroit and Baltimore revealed similar findings. Mothers described la managing language barriers as a battle and expressed a preference for bilingual providers. They expressed negative bias towards interpreters, getting by with limited language skills, fear of, a burden, fear of being a burden, and stigma and discrimination as major concerns. A review of coping strategies among Latino caregivers of children with chronic illnesses found that language, cultural dissimilarities, differences in health beliefs, and feeling disrespected were common challenges faced. Sources of support among lower income, recent immigrants with limited English proficiency were principally from the family. Feelings of isolation, furthermore, were more pronounced and emerged from having a significantly smaller social network. Together, these studies underscore the impact of wider intersubjective processes on health outcomes and healthcare access. Feelings of aloneness and isolation, lack of social support, struggles for access, and othering 
all place Latinos at risk of diminishing emotional health. These new directions in research on language as social determinant of health suggest the need for a different idiom of social justice mobilization when discussing the relationship of Spanish to Latino health. Studies on the interaction of language and other social determinants suggest that the effects of Spanish language preference, use, and proficiency are situated and contextual. Studies on the wider intersubjective processes affecting Spanish speakers suggest that language barriers interact with emotionally debilitating experiences both within the healthcare setting and beyond it. What these approaches have in common is their insistence on viewing language as couched in a larger set of processes that impact health outcomes and healthcare access. The social determinant model, however, has difficulty capturing the embeddedness and intersectionality of language with other social determinants, wider intersubjective processes, and many times multimorbid physical and mental health conditions. The unidirectional nature of the model and its bias towards causation as opposed to interaction leads me to question its ability to adequately capture the multi-layered and complex relationship between Spanish and Latino health. Syndemic theory is an alternative way to conceptualize the relationship between Spanish and Latino health. Syndemic is an idiom of social justice mobilization for health that values the complexity of interacting social factors and it looks beyond disease causation to focus instead on the various experiences of living with disease. Rooted in medical anthropology, Syndemic theory arose out of concerns around medical comorbid comorbidities and the social factors that, in that interacted with those comorbidities. Merrill Singer coined the term syndemic as a blend of the words synergy and epidemic to express the dominant focus of the approach on synergies in disease states. The concept emerged from Sim Singer's work for, among HIV AIDS patients in Connecticut. He found that most HIV AIDS interventions that he encountered were designed primarily with middle class white homosexual men in mind. These interventions were of little use in his work where he encountered HIV AIDS patients who did not match, not only not match the demographic bias, but were also experiencing other conditions together with HIV AIDS, namely substance abuse and violence. He thus set out to explore the experience of living with AIDS in conjunction with substance abuse and violence and characterized his work as focusing on the SAVA, S-A-V-A, substance abuse, violence, uh, and AIDS syndemic. He defines the term syndemic, as I've put it here, the concentration and deleterious interaction of two or more diseases or other health conditions in a population, especially as a consequence of social inequity and the unjust exercise of power. Syndemic then moves us away from a focus on causation and invites us to focus instead on interaction. This figure, describing a syndemic model of substance abuse, intimate partner violence, HIV infection, and mental health conditions, visually represents the distinctive features of the syndemic perspective. In this figure, the cross-figured uh, cross-shaped figure in the middle represents the syndemic interaction of the four identified health conditions. The circles represent upstream social factors that influenced the four-pronged syndemic interaction, including individual factors, cultural factors, relationship factors, and social environmental factors. These factors not only interact with the four, identify, the four conditions identified in the syndemic, but they also interact with each other as represented in the dual-headed dual arrows linking each circle. Right? So everything is interacting and interconnected. The syndemic perspective has been profitably applied to Latino health. Emily Mendenhall described the Vida syndemic affecting Mexican immigrant women in Chicago. The Vida Syndemic analyzes the interactions between violence, immigration, depression, diabetes, and abuse. Her analysis of the syndemic 
draws on the life stories of women whose biographies personify the complex interactions and interrelatedness of experiences such as childhood trauma, struggles for social integration, sexual coercion and violence, family stress, depression, and the everyday stresses of managing diabetes. She demonstrates how structural factors such as food deserts, unsafe neighborhoods, and discrimination interact with sociocultural factors such as acculturation and gender roles, which in turn interact with individual factors such as childhood experiences and coping mechanisms, and with relationship factors such as family conflict and social support, in order to create an excess burden of diabetes, depression, immigration, violence, and abuse. Gonzalez Guarda describes a syndemic of substance abuse, intimate partner violence, HIV, and mental health among Latino men. She argues that cultural factors such as immigration-related stress and adherence to cultural values such as familismo, machismo, and marianismo, and the influence of religion may all serve to link syndemic conditions. While these factors may contribute to an excessive burden of disease in some cases, in other cases she argues that cultural factors may also be health protective. For example, the cultural value of familismo can be an important protective factor when families accept and support children identifying with a minority sexual orientation. The application of a syndemic sensibility has the potential of considerably advancing our understanding of the relationship of Spanish and Latino health. It invites us to contextualize Spanish language preference, use, and proficiency in ways that previous studies have overlooked. Further, it invites us to adopt a more granular perspective on language concordant encounters. A syndemic sensibility in the study of Spanish and Latino health, moreover, can open up new lines of research for instance, how do life course events and experiences shape and contribute to syndemic production? Questions such as this will open our research purview to language experiences that are currently invisible to us. What role do childhood or recent immigrant experiences of linguistic othering play in the burden of disease within Latino populations? And this brings us back full circle to Mari Carmen Gonzalez. Her story is one of multiple conditions, all interacting with each other and increasing the burden of disease, changing her experience of the disease. I think we owe to Mari Carmen Gonzalez to expand our questioning and to try to truly understand her plight. Only in this way can we begin to lighten her load and get closer to that one day that drives her. Thank you. Thank you.